Good morning. What a great summary that was of the second half of the Gospel of John. We're actually concluding our journey through this entire Gospel of John in chapter 21 today. At this point in the story, Jesus has already been crucified. He'd been laid in the tomb. He has risen from the dead. And Mary Magdalene discovered the empty tomb. Peter and John came rushing in to examine it for themselves because they didn't believe her when she had told them that it was empty. Jesus had appeared then in a tender encounter with Mary Magdalene that same night. And he appeared to all of the disciples except Thomas, who wasn't present at the time. Somewhere along the way, he, he had walked and talked and broke bread with some disciples on the road to Emmaus. And a, a week later, he reappeared to the disciples. And this time, Thomas was there and got to see with his own eyes and, and touch Jesus with his own hands. And he believed. But in all of these encounters we need to recognize all of these encounters after Jesus' resurrection, there is no personal address to the apostle Peter. Remember Peter? Just a few short chapters ago, Jesus was being beaten and flogged and mocked and crucified, and Peter standing outside that courtyard looking and what's going on denies his Lord three times, just as Jesus said that he would. And now Jesus has risen. And all of these stories begin pouring back in from all of these disciples and all of these wonderful personal encounters that people are having with the living Lord from Mary Magdalene to the disciples on the road to Emmaus and Peter even sees with his own eyes the doubt of Thomas melt away in the presence of Jesus. But for Peter, nothing. For him who had denied Christ three times, there's no personal word. There was nothing recorded. I wonder if Peter didn't have to think to himself, well, I guess I blew it. I've committed the unpardonable sin now three times denying my Lord. Perhaps there's, perhaps there's no portion for me in this walk of faith. In fact, wasn't it Jesus himself who said, if anyone denies me before men, I will deny him before my Father who is in heaven. You can be sure those words were ringing in Peter's mind as these stories were flooding in and he was watching Jesus' personal encounters with others. Question for you. Have you ever failed someone that you deeply love? If you have, do you know what that makes you? Human. That makes you human. Because we all fail. If you haven't, just wait. It'll happen. It's coming. You will. We all do. Have you ever failed someone that you loved so badly that you felt it could never be restored to a right relationship? What effects did this have on your relationship? What effects is it having in your relationship now? And if this was a failure before the Lord, what effect is it having on your walk of faith right now? Well, we begin to see in chapter 21 of John the effect that this type of failure had on Peter. Turn with me to John chapter 21, beginning in verse 1. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples 
by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathanael from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into a boat. But that night, they caught nothing. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, We thank you for the power of your word. You have declared that your word will not go forth and return to you without accomplishing that for which you have sent it. And Lord, I pray that as we dig into just a little bit of chapter 21 today, that your word would have its full effect in my heart and in my life and in our heart as the body of Christ here at Millard Alliance Church. And in all that you are calling us to in this season of life and ministry, in our church, in our neighborhood, in our city, in our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going fishing. It doesn't seem like much, that little phrase. That is, until you realize some of its significance for Peter, I think what Peter is saying is, I'm going back to the life I knew before I ever got called into this crazy walk of faith. Maybe Peter's saying, I screwed it up so badly, he doesn't want me back. I I might as well abandon it all and go back to what I know I know how to do, fish. Have you ever been there? I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. So they got into the boat. And they fished all night long, and they caught nothing. A little insult to injury, a little salt in the wound. I'm going back to the one thing I know, and nothing. Caught nothing. Isn't that just like God, though? You see, Jesus had already called them away from their nets in Matthew chapter 4. He called them to fish for men. He told them in John 6 not to work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. And now Peter, perhaps out of guilt or shame or condemnation and the, the heartache that that has beset him for his own failure of his Lord, has returned to his old and his own self-sufficient, self-reliant ways. And he has come up with nothing. Enter Jesus in verse 4. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore But the disciples didn't recognize it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, have you any fish? Have you any fish? The question that every professional fisherman loves to hear when they've caught nothing after a long, hard night's work, right? Have you caught any fish? The word here is actually interesting. Uh, The word that's translated in most translations as fish here is not actually literally fish. There's two words that are used in the New Testament for fish. One is ichthus, and the other is opsarion. Um, John uses ichthus a few times, and he uses opsarion about five times. But here, the word is actually prosphagion. And it means anything eaten with bread. It's often referred to um, with fish in their region because they were fishermen by trade. 
uh, but it's really talking about a meal. Jesus yells from the shore to these guys, professional fishermen who have been fishing all night and have caught nothing. Did you catch a meal? <laughs> what a funny question to ask. You could imagine their reaction, professional fishermen fishing all night long. And some gentleman from the shore shouts, did you catch yourself a meal? Through gritted teeth and perhaps some expletives under the breath. No, we didn't catch a thing. Nothing. Thanks for the reminder. Verse 6. Now, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Interesting. Here, John uses the word ichthus because of the large number of ichthus, fish. Then, verse 7. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he, had, and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net up full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning, uh, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And as soon as Peter heard John say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him and he jumped into the water. The word here is literally threw himself in, plunged into the water without carrying where he fell, like just chucking himself over the side of the boat. It's a strange detail here that John includes. Think about this. We don't generally put more clothes on to go swimming. I mean, in general, right, we remove a layer or two uh, of our clothing, our coverings to go swimming. But Peter puts on his clothes to jump in the water. Maybe it's explained away because just of Peter's excitement. He didn't know what was going on, so he just grabbed his clothes and went. Or maybe it was, you know, the proper thing to do to be fully clothed when approaching an esteemed teacher. Maybe. But it has such an echo of Eden to me. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord. He wrapped his outer garment around him. Sounds an awful lot like Genesis 3. When the eyes of both Adam and Eve were opened and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and they made coverings for themselves. Then the man heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. I have to wonder in, in Peter's state of mind. The nakedness of his soul was laid bare before Christ, whom he had denied before a charcoal fire back in chapter 18. And don't we have a subconscious way, a tendency to, to mirror physically what's going on within us mentally or emotionally? Surely the Lord can't see me like this. I've got to cover up and make myself presentable, acceptable to the Lord. Verse 8. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. <laughs> I love that, that you have just caught, right? They'd returned 
to the life that they once knew, to the way of life that they thought they knew they knew how to do. They fished all night and caught no fishes, as the little kid's song goes, right? And Jesus sits there on the shore cooking fish over a charcoal fire just waiting for them. The imagery is stark, must have been stark for Peter. It was a charcoal fire back in chapter 18 where he denied his Lord and now his Lord waits for him at a charcoal fire. Verse 10. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, uh, with, even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Peter, you thought you were left to provide for yourself. But I called you to rely on my provision, on my power toward you, on my great grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor for us, His crazy love. And the truth is, many times we struggle understanding it. If you find yourself struggling to understand God's grace, don't beat yourself up. Even the disciples struggled with understanding grace. Jesus, is that you? You're alive. I can't believe you're alive. Okay, I was in the boat and I wasn't catching any fish, okay? But I heard this voice and the voice said, cast your net to the other side. And so I'm thinking, I'm a fisherman. I know what I'm doing, but I'm not catching any fish, you know? And so I throw that net over there and then a gaggle of fish pop into that net and I'm going, this is a total miracle. Who could have done that? I need to know who told me to throw the net to the other side. And boom, I look up and I mean, there is you. You're looking at me on the seashore going, it is I, the Lord, and you're alive. I can't believe you're alive. <laughs> this is awesome. Andrew, get out of the boat. Come on. Peter, yeah. do you love me? Yes, I love you. I love you. You're alive. This is so great. Good, and, then feed my sheep. Andrew, get out of the boat. Come on, man. It's him. Peter, Yeah. do you love me? I love you, yes. And I'm so sorry about that rooster cluck, and I had no idea what that meant, but I do not. I'm better for it, all right? Okay. Then feed my sheep. Andrew, I'm smiling, but I'm serious. Come on, get out of the boat. It's him. Peter, Yeah. do you love me? Jesus, mere words cannot describe the passion that I have for you. I love you. You know everything. I love you. Good. Good. Then feed my sheep. I didn't even know you had livestock. That is so like you, though. There's something new about you all the time. That's what I love about you. Peter, yeah. do you remember uh, the morning the ladies went to the tomb? Yeah, 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 yeah. We're all in the upper room trying to figure out what to do next, you know, because we thought you were dead. You know, you were dead, you know, and we're trying to figure all that out, you know. And Mary comes running up, and Mary's like saying, beehive, beehive, beehive. And I'm thinking, I'm allergic to bees. Like, keep them out. You know what I'm saying? But as she kept getting closer, I heard her correctly. She was saying, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. And we're going, who's alive, who's alive? And she said, she was at the tomb, and the tomb was empty. And she said that the, there was an angel there. And the angel said, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay, he is risen. And so me and John, we hightailed it down there. And if John says he beat me, he's totally lying, all right? I beat him, FYI, all right, you know? And we get down there, and I'm looking in that tomb, and it is, it is empty. There's nothing in there, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, what does this mean? What does this mean? And John is right there. John is so good with words. He should write a book. He is so good with words. And John said, don't you get it, Peter? This is everything Jesus said he was going to do, and you did it, and it's done. Let's go. This is so great. Wait, yeah. the angel said what? Uh, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay. He is risen. You've risen. Let's go. This he is okay. said what? Go tell the disciples and Peter. Go 
and tell the disciples and Peter. You said my name. Why did you say my name? Peter, that's grace. No, no, I don't, I don't deserve that because that night people kept coming up to me asking me if I belonged to you, if I was with you, and I kept denying you left and right, all right? No, it'll take me my whole life to make up for what I did. It was unforgivable for no, what I did. No, What I did on the cross was meant to take what is unforgivable and make it forgivable. That's my grace. It's not about you. It's always about me. That's grace, Peter. Jesus not only reinstates Peter as a full functioning fisher of men, but he develops the role of disciple for all believers. You see, this kingdom excursion is not catch and eat. It's not even catch and release. We're not just to catch people for Christ and then just release them into the world on their own strength and power. We're to feed them and to lead them into deeper maturity in Him in the context of community. Jesus has already transitioned Jesus from a fisherman to a fisher of men. And here He's transitioning Peter from a fisher of men to a shepherd. Is there a difference? A fisherman doesn't have to have a lot of relationship with his fish, right? There's not a lot of warm fuzzies and relational uh, exchanges between the fisherman and his fish. But a shepherd, that's, that's something completely different. Leading, loving, nurturing, investing into the lives of his flock. And he transitions Peter from a fisher of men to a shepherd with A very odd question. Look at verse 15 with me. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Oftentimes as we read this passage or we study through this or we listen to teachings on it, there's a lot of focus put on the words that are translated as love throughout this exchange. However, I'd like to draw your attention to a different phrase in this verse, in verse 15. Do you truly love me more than these? Some would say Jesus means, do you love me more than these other people love me, more than these other disciples love me? But I don't think that's Jesus' point here at all. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than you love these fish? More than you love the life you once knew before I encountered you? Is your love for me greater than a great catch? Do you truly love me more than the rush that you get when you're out in the boat or the money that that haul brings in for you or more than the 153 trophies on your wall, more than the reputation you earn by what you do? Peter, do you truly love me More than these. Jesus says, out of your love for me, Peter, care for those that I love. There's this moment of turnaround for Peter here. But Jesus doesn't leave the focus on Peter. Jesus quickly shifts. Yes, you are forgiven, Peter. Yes, you are reinstated. Yes, your calling is still sure. I'm still calling you to what I originally called you to, but there's more. Now get the focus off of yourself and look out and engage. 
engage with those I have given you to shepherd. Friends, I don't care what you have done today or yesterday or this past week or this past year or this past decade. If you are hearing this in person or online, you are not beyond the reach of God's grace. Peter watched his Lord Christ being crucified and denied him three times to a little slave girl, to a Roman officer, to another slave of a high priest, warming themselves around a charcoal fire that dark night. But today, the morning has dawned, and Jesus sits at a charcoal fire with all of the provision you could ever need beyond anything you could ever drag in yourself jesus is already sitting on the shore cooking the meal for them that they had struggled all night long To achieve for themselves in their own strength. And with one word of his mouth, his provision is made manifest to them. Well, maybe you've gone back to your old way of life. Have you caught anything? Did you catch a meal? Have you found anything? fulfilling in it at all. Perhaps Jesus will even bring about some temporal blessings and fill your net, so to speak, and you drag it in, fulfilling or just fish. He accomplished everything that you need on the cross of Calvary. And Jesus says to you and to me, stop striving in your own strength. Come to me and I will give you what truly satisfies. And like Peter in the boat that day, we have to do two things. We have to look up and recognize that it's Jesus calling to us. See Jesus standing, sitting there on the beach with all of the provision that he has paid for on the cross of Calvary to provide for you. But don't cover up like Peter and like is so, it is so often my own tendency to do when I have failed. Don't cover up. Come to Jesus in full transparency, in brutal honesty because he knows and he loves you anyway look up and repent repentance is is a deep change of heart and mind that leads me to reject and forsake all known sin and the right to run my life independently of God. It's a 180 degree turn. I've been living life for myself and I turn to receive the provision that Jesus has accomplished for me on the cross of Calvary. He calls Peter, he calls you, and he calls me to look up and to turn to him in repentance. But he doesn't leave us there either. He says, look out, Peter. It's not all about you. Look out to the people that he has placed before you to shepherd, to be a godly influence on, to pour your life into. Who has the Lord placed in your life 
to shepherd, to lead, to live an example before, to walk alongside in this journey of faith. This is not only a call for pastors, right? This is a call for you to pastor, to shepherd, to lead, to walk beside people in their walk of faith. This is a call for us as individuals. But as we so profoundly heard in this last week when our, our dear brother Mark Young was here sharing with us from the Philippines, this is also a call to us as a local church. Millard Alliance Church Jesus is calling us to look up, to see the provision that Christ has made, that he has poured out for us his blood for our forgiveness of sins and his Holy Spirit for the power to live the life that he is calling us to live, the power to love our neighbors, the power to love those, the people who are around us but perhaps not like us, the power to engage our neighborhoods with the truth of the transforming encounter that is possible with God through Jesus Christ and the power of his Holy Spirit. Our call as a church has not changed. It's to reach the lost, to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But maybe there's a sense in which we've lost that sense of mission and slipped back into the lives that we knew we once knew how to do. And we can fish all night in our own strength too. And when the dawn arrives, we could find all of our self-effort has amounted to nothing. Our calling has not changed, but we can't do it in our own strength. We must be empowered by the Holy Spirit to engage our communities for Christ. And Jesus might say to us, no, you can't do it the way you've always done it. Cast your nets to the other side. Try a different approach and see if I don't pour out my abundant blessing as you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit among you and within you and through you. Our calling as individuals and our calling as the church is one and the same. It is to fish and to feed. To reach the lost with the saving message of Jesus Christ. And the reconciliation that we can have through his blood and the power of his spirit. That we might be in right relationship with God our creator. And to feed them and walk alongside them and nurture them. This is what discipleship means. To fish and to feed. As we move toward our communion time in our service today, I would encourage you. Approach the Lord in full transparency and just ask the Lord, is there any way in which I have resorted to my own self-reliance or self-sufficiency and I've blocked out the power of forgiveness and reconciliation and restoration 
that Jesus, you have offered to me through the cleansing power of your blood and the power of your Holy Spirit to live this life you're calling me to live. Could you approach the Lord as we go to our communion time? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your life, your blood poured out on our behalf. That we might be cleansed and made new and made right with you. And we thank you, Lord, for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. To give us the power, your power, your life in us and through us and upon us. To live a righteous life. And to live out a bold witness for your kingdom's sake. Lord, would we lay ourselves at your feet as we approach the communion table today. And we give thanks for your provision for us your body broken for us, for our healing and our wholeness, and your blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And Lord, may your spirit fall upon us this day.